On June 15, 1943, at 25,000 feet above the cold gray waters of the English Channel, German ace pilot Klaus Briner narrowed his eyes behind the curved canopy of his Messerschmitt BF-109 and studied the American formation ahead of him with barely concealed amusement. Eight Republic P-47 Thunderbolts lumbering through the sky like bloated industrial machines rather than fighters. Their thick fuselages earning them the Luftwaffe nickname Jug, short for milk bottle, an aircraft. German pilots had been destroying with methodical ease for months, because Briner knew the numbers as well as any intelligence officer. The Thunderbolt climbed like a fully loaded freight train, barely 1,500 feet per minute on its best day, while his Messerschmitt could claw skyward at more than double that rate, dictating every engagement in the vertical plane where modern air combat was decided. And as he rolled inverted and began his attack dive, expecting the Americans to scatter or dive away as they always did. Something happened that defied everything the Luftwaffe believed about American fighters, because the lead P-47 did not flee, did not turn away, but instead pitched sharply upward into a climb so aggressive it seemed physically impossible, the massive aircraft rearing into the thin air at nearly 2,000 feet per minute, engine howling at full power, forcing Briner to pull harder on his stick as the American fighter followed him into his own domain, and four. The first time since he had entered combat, Klaus Briner felt a flicker of genuine fear as he realized the joke aircraft of the European skies was suddenly climbing with him, driven by 13 feet of revolutionary paddle-shaped propeller blades that transformed brute engine power into something terrifyingly effective. That moment in the sky represented the visible symptom of a crisis that had been quietly consuming American fighter development for months, because by September 1943, Internal reports from the European theater painted a grim picture that no optimistic briefing could conceal, with seasoned American pilots openly requesting transfers to any aircraft that was not a P-47. Frustrated by an interceptor that possessed enormous power, heavy armor, and devastating firepower, yet remained fatally. Handicapped by its inability to climb, leaving Thunderbolt units vulnerable to German fighters that simply loitered above them before diving at will, and at Wright Field in Ohio, Colonel James Johnson leafed through combat assessments as his coffee cooled beside him, the numbers brutal and undeniable. The P-47's climb rate of 1,500 feet per minute rendered it helpless against Messerschmitts and Focke-Wolfs that could ascend at more than 3,000 feet per minute, allowing German pilots to control every engagement, turning the American fighter into a target rather than a hunter, and yet hidden within those same reports was an overlooked truth, because the P-47's Pratt & Whitney R 2800 double WASP engine produced over 2300 horsepower, more than any fighter engine in the world, and if that power could somehow be translated efficiently into thrust, the Thunderbolt should have been unstoppable. While commanders saw failure, Frank Caldwell saw physics, sitting in his cramped office at Hamilton Standard, staring at charts and torque curves rather than casualty figures, recognizing that the engine was not the problem, nor the airframe, but the propeller itself, a narrow-bladed design rooted in great war thinking, optimized for cruise efficiency rather than raw combat thrust, incapable of absorbing the immense torque generated by the R-2800, its 11-foot diameter blades approaching. Supersonic tip speeds at full throttle, creating shock waves that destroyed lift and turned precious horsepower into useless noise, and Caldwell's solution violated nearly every principle of conventional propeller design, because instead of thin, elegant blades, he envisioned something closer to a ship's propeller, thick, wide, paddle-shaped blades that would seize massive volumes of air and hurl them backward with brute force, sacrificing elegance for effectiveness, a design that looked absurd to traditional aerodynamicists but promised to unlock the engine's true potential. His colleagues listened politely and objected immediately, citing increased weight, greater drag, manufacturing nightmares, and the enormous cost of retooling factories already producing thousands of conventional propellers, while competitors like Curtis Electric dismissed the idea outright in favor of incremental improvements that could be manufactured cheaply and safely leaving the Army Air Forces caught between conservative reliability and radical possibility, because choosing Caldwell's. 
Design meant gambling lives on an unproven concept, even as Luftwaffe intelligence officers across occupied Europe dismissed the P-47 as a crude American brute, heavy, inefficient, and predictable, joking that shooting one down was like hunting a flying refrigerator, certain to fall once hit, unaware that a quiet revolution was taking shape in American workshops. The first experimental paddleblade propeller mounted on AP-47D at Wright Field in October 1943 looked almost comical, oversized and crude, and test pilot Captain Robert Anderson barely lasted 14 minutes before landing with severe vibration reports that threatened to tear the aircraft apart, confirming fears that the massive blades introduced harmonic forces far beyond what existing hubs could tolerate, forcing Caldwell's team into weeks of redesign, forging new blade routes completely, re-engineering the hub, adding weight to the nose, and confronting the brutal reality that radical ideas demand radical solutions at every level. Yet even when vibration was solved, early results disappointed, climb rates improving only marginally, speed gains modest, giving Curtis Electric's conservative design apparent vindication. Until Caldwell realized the real limitation lay in pitch control systems calibrated for narrow blades, not paddle-shaped giants that demanded a far greater range of adjustment to operate efficiently across different flight regimes. Working 18-hour days, Caldwell's team redesigned the constant speed propeller system itself, doubling pitch adjustment range, overhauling hydraulic governors, re-engineering cooling airflow that now moved more slowly despite greater volume, battling engine overheating that threatened to destroy the R-2800 under sustained power, all while Pentagon officials questioned whether the P-47 deserved saving at all given the rising promise of the P-51 Mustang. But on December 8, 1943, everything changed when the modified Thunderbolt climbed to 20,000 feet in just over 10 minutes, achieving a sustained climb rate of 1,850 feet per minute at full combat weight, then tore through speed trials at 45 miles per hour faster than baseline aircraft at altitude, not because of reduced drag, but because the paddle blades finally allowed the engine to do what it had always been capable of doing, converting power into dominance. Most astonishing was dive recovery, long a fatal weakness of the Thunderbolt, because the fine pitch paddle blades generated enough reverse thrust to arrest momentum and pull the aircraft out of dives that previously killed pilots, transforming survivability overnight. Yet German intelligence dismissed these developments as desperate tinkering, even as Colonel Johnson authorized limited production for combat testing, ordering 50 paddle blade propellers for frontline deployment, a gamble. Measured in lives, and by March 1944, when the first modified P-47s arrived at RAF bases in England, veteran pilots mocked the oversized blades and resisted flying them until combat left no room for opinion, and on March 22nd, over Berlin, Polish ace Mike Gladick led a flight of modified Thunderbolts that climbed directly into diving Messerschmitts instead of fleeing, maintaining 1,700 feet per minute at 30,000 feet, shattering German tactical assumptions in a three-minute engagement that spread shockwaves through Luftwaffe command channels as pilots reported American fighters matching them in the vertical, something previously unthinkable. Captured aircraft soon confirmed the nightmare, German engineers discovering metallurgy and hydraulic precision beyond their own production capabilities, realizing the Americans had solved a problem German designers believed unsolvable, and by April, P-47 units equipped with paddle blades were reporting dramatic increases in kill ratios and survivability as altitude dominance. The cornerstone of Luftwaffe doctrine evaporated, forcing German pilots into low-altitude engagements where Thunderbolt's armor and 8.50 caliber guns proved devastating, and by May, production surged to 200 propellers per month as factories ran around the clock, data confirming 40% higher victory rates and 30% lower losses, convincing the Pentagon to authorize fleet-wide conversion across Europe and the Pacific. The true test came on June 6, 1944, as nearly 400 paddleblade equipped P-47s thundered across the channel at dawn, climbing with authority unimaginable months earlier, covering the largest amphibious invasion in history while German fighters were conspicuously absent from skies they once owned, because when they did appear, they were intercepted, climbed upon, 
and destroyed by thunderbolts that no longer needed to dive away to survive, with pilots reporting American fighters at altitudes once considered safe havens, Allied sorties exceeding 14,000 that day while the Luftwaffe managed fewer than 300, losses mounting at unsustainable rates, and by nightfall, German commanders acknowledged the skies over Normandy were lost. As the war ground toward its end, over 12,000 paddleblade propellers rolled off American assembly lines, turning a mocked aircraft into a terror, producing exchange ratios exceeding 9 to 1, collapsing German bomber operations entirely, forcing abandoned projects and shattered doctrine, and when victory came in May 1945, Frank Caldwell sat quietly in his office reviewing production numbers that told a story far larger than himself, a revolution born not from new engines or new aircraft, but from the courage to rethink how power was used, a lesson that reshaped American aviation, manufacturing, and strategic dominance long after the guns fell silent, proving that sometimes the most decisive innovations are not elegant, not conservative, and not immediately understood, but brutally effective, because 13 feet of paddle-shaped steel had changed the course of the air war over Europe and ensured that the once ridiculed flying milk bottle would be remembered as one of the most formidable fighters of the Second World War.